Hello everybody, welcome to this talk. The title of this talk is Big Sim Energy. So without further ado, please welcome our speaker, Kenneth K. Over to you. Hello. Uh, so Big Sim Energy at MicroSim Cost. My name is Kenneth K. I'm with Jupiter One. We're a startup. Um, I'll tell you all about Jupiter One if you want to hear about it after the presentation. But this this is not really about Jupiter One itself. It's about something that I discovered while I was working at Jupiter One. I am uh, one of the security architects at Jupiter One. Uh, as a startup, we wear many hats, so I do more than just security architecture stuff. Uh, and one of the things that I did as I'm going through there is how can I get the most bang for our buck? Well, one of the things that a startup is really concerned about is exactly that. We don't have a whole lot of funding. Uh, we don't have like a huge revenue income yet because we're still trying to build out the business. So how can I get all the things that a security team is supposed to be doing without having to pay the kind of money that uh, well-off, well-established companies can afford to do? So Sims are expensive, we all know that. Anybody who has dealt with Sims or uh, security in general know that these things are not uh, cheap. There are two general pricing models. There's a pricing model by volume, meaning gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes, however much data you have. And then there's another pricing model that's based on events. Uh, in the, in, a lot of my talk is gonna be focused on AWS because my company is very AWS centered. So your mileage may vary if you're talking about Azure or GCP. But with respect to AWS, guard duty is very event centered. It counts the number of events that it evaluates and it charges you based on those per million events. And then there are these build your own uh, solutions. They still need to be hosted somewhere. So you're still paying for the compute. You're still paying for the storage. You're still paying for the networking activity. Plus on top of that, you have to pay for somebody to go in there and actually build the thing and then maintain it. Whether you're talking about building detections or if you're talking about actually building the VMs or the containers or whatever you're gonna be using to do it, somebody's gotta do that. And if you just hand it off to a member of the security team, They've got another job on top of that, which is to actually respond to the security incidents, to actually secure things and double check stuff. So then you've got a quarter of a person dedicated to maintaining infrastructure that is critical to making sure that you don't miss something and you don't get popped. Not, very, not a very good look when you're talking to investors and other companies and saying, hey, we're a startup where we wanna go out and IPO and stuff, but we can't prove to you that a SIM is working well. So, Matano, while it's open source, and I love open source, not a really good fit for us in particular, simply because we don't have the manpower to do it right. So what do we do instead? I looked at the documentation, RTFM. And you'll notice, uh, this is a very common thing with, with hackers in general. Not that I would consider myself among the elite of hackers or anything, but I've got the kind of mindset, take advantage of things, right? So if you read the documentation that is presented to you from AWS about all these different services, you find out how their pricing models are. They, they want you to know their pricing models. But I'm not sure that they know exactly what their pricing models are themselves. Like, I don't know if there's a lot of crosstalk between the different uh, people responsible for the different services in AWS. So what I found was that CloudTrail has a certain pricing model. EventBridge has a different type of pricing model. SNS has its own pricing model, and Chatbot, which is a fairly recent uh, addition to the AWS service list, which is, I don't know, 286 and growing services, uh, they all have different pricing models, and Chatbot is free, at least right now. So if you add these things together, you can build yourself a microSIM. Now, one thing that has always bothered me about SIMs, I've been doing security for almost 20 years now in various contexts, and one thing that's always bothered me about a SIM that you either purchase out of the box and you run it in your own on-premises installation or it's a managed service or something like that, is that yes, it comes out of the box with a whole bunch of detections, great. You don't have to worry about building your own detections. But on the other hand, it comes out of the box with a whole bunch of detections that may or may not apply to your environment. And that's where we get noise and we get analyst fatigue and we get a whole bunch of overhead that you have to staff up. And this is where the traditional SOC comes from. You have 20 people sitting there paying attention to all these alerts and dismissing 99% of them as false positives because they're just noise or they're acceptable within your environment. They're normal for your environment. So that is very, in my opinion, that's a very top down approach. Here's all of these rules, turn them all on and then filter out the noise. 
Well, you could also build it bottom up. You could take a look at your environment and use a threat modeling approach. And OWASP has a free version uh, Threat Dragon. Microsoft has a threat modeling program that they give away for free if you're in a Microsoft environment. But the whole point is, if you do a threat model, you can, take an, you can identify fairly easily in your environment, your architecture, your processes, your applications, whatever it is, and you can find out these are the critical points that need to be protected above all else. These are the actions that we worry about. These are the things that keep us up at night. And what you can then do is you can build detections around those most critical key components and implement them first. And maybe later on, if you're a startup and you get more funding and you get more people on board, you can go out and you can buy one of the big sims that have a thousand and one rules that are gonna go off at all times of the day and night and half of them don't apply to you in the first place. Or you can start off with just analyzing your environment, detecting where the biggest threats are, and then custom building a couple of rules that say, hey, this should never happen in our environment. And if it does, wake somebody up. And that way you eliminate all the noise by designing it based on the threats to your environment, as opposed to just taking a blank slate of the, here's the, all of these rules that you should be paying attention to. And not to, not to denigrate any SIM provider whatsoever, but a lot of them are still looking backwards. The rule sets that they provide are applied, generally speaking, to legacy environments. Environments that are, that are architected in a legacy way for on-premises servers and banks with people maintaining them and installations that have uh, a lot of different aspects associated with like the, the CIA triad. Well, one of the things that we do, at least at Jupiter One, is we're a cloud native company and we're following the DIE triad. I don't know if anybody got to see Sunil Yu's uh, keynote this morning. I worked, at Sunil, I worked with Sunil Yu years ago when he developed the DIE triad. And then, co coincidence of coincidence, he got hired at uh, Jupiter One about a month before I got hired at Jupiter One, which was kind of serendipitous. I've always liked working with him. And the, his, the DIE triad that he developed makes so much sense to the cloud native wor world. Design your applications, design your infrastructure, not just your applications, but design your infrastructure to be distributed by default. Nothing sits on one server. Everything sits on multiple servers distributed across multiple regions. Therefore, it can't be taken down unless you take all of Amazon down. And if you take all of Amazon down, we've got bigger problems than worrying about whether or not Jupyter One is available to our customers. It has to be immutable. Now, how do you make something immutable? Well, that's really a challenge because there isn't really a way to do that to guarantee immutability within AWS. But if you build your CI CD pipeline for development such that the engineers can't actually log into your AWS console and make changes, then and it has to go through the checks, it has to go through the peer reviews and things like that, then what you have is essentially the equivalent of immutable infrastructure. And you can, by threat modeling your environment, as I was mentioned before, mentioning earlier, you can say none of these things should change unless they come from our CI CD pipeline. And if you put that monitoring in, it's very easy to see if an attacker compromises an account somewhere because they're not gonna know that. They're gonna go in there and try to change a Lambda in place. And that's gonna set off an alarm and you're gonna know about it. So distributed, immutable, and then ephemeral. You can't attack something that doesn't exist. And lambdas are a, great idea, are, are a great example of that. Containers, less so. But a lambda is not actually out there. You can't take advantage of it unless you have called it. And if your application, like ours, is a web-based application, and we've got a strict cross-site uh, origin policy, and we've got content security policies and things like that, you can't call our APIs unless it's, from, unless it's going through the gateway that authorizes those things, make sure that you have the, per, the correct permission, both the auth N and auth Z to do that. And so at, none of this infrastructure exists to be attacked 99% of the time. It only exists when it's executing the function. The website itself is a combination of 50 different Lambda calls or so that only are running long enough to return the information back to your browser. Your browser caches it and displays it to you and it's working, but there's nothing on the server side in the cloud that's actually working at the time. There's nothing to attack. So by following these principles, we can design a cloud native application that really makes it easier for us to uh, secure whatever we're doing and is not necessarily very relevant to legacy detections created by SIMs that have been working for the past you know, 20 years and trying to help companies out. 
Containers a little bit less so because containers generally live a little bit longer than lambdas do. But if you have a policy in place that causes your containers to be recycled and then rebuilt from the, the static image, mitigates most of that too. So putting it all together, and you'll notice the note up there in the corner, this is the, the documentation gotcha that I noticed. You hit an event, it gets sent to CloudTrail. Of course, you have to configure CloudTrail in your environment, but um, all management events, the first copy of all management events that go to CloudTrail is free. Management ev events contain a whole lot of different things, especially as uh, regards the configuration of your assets, whether your Lambda is configured to run now or it, it can run for a long time or something like that. That's all part of management events. Now, the actual code that you have in your Lambda, that's a data event. Uh, so you have, to, you have to enable data events, which has a, an additional cost to it. But in this example that I'm gonna work through, we're talking about management events because the first copy is free. And then you can send that to EventBridge. Now, EventBridge, as, as the comment here says, it charges you for every evaluation, just like Guard Duty, Guard Duty does. However, it doesn't charge you for default service events. What is that? A default service is a service that's turned on for you by default or a default service turn on for you by default, is a default service in your AWS account. Something like the login service. In order to log into your AWS account, the login service has to be running before you log in or else you can't log in. It's default. And EventBridge doesn't charge you for evaluating events from default services. Whatever is turned on by, uh, by design, by automatic. Anything that you turn on that is extra, so for example, CloudTrail is not a default service. It's not always turned on. You have to turn it on. So if there's something that is generated by the CloudTrail service itself that you want to, to um, evaluate, then you're gonna get charged in EventBridge for it because it's not a default service. But the sign-in service is, now I've got the dashed line here leading to lambdas because I'm not doing that. I'm actually gonna do a demo and show you how to do this live, and if the, if the internet gods are not with me, I have a recorded version, uh, just in case. But you could, as an output from EventBridge, feed that over to a Lambda. And let's say you have a very well-known remediation set, a set of remediation steps for something that goes wrong on a not uncommon basis in your environment. You could have the output of that EventBridge rule say, fire off this Lambda to fix the problem because we regularly have salespeople that get themselves locked out of their email accounts for sending too many emails, and that's something that we need to just handle automatically. I don't want my security people having to deal with that. It's not a security event. It comes in over the wire, but I don't want my people dealing with that. And it's a known, easy set of remediation steps that I can programmatically access via APIs. So I might implement that as a Lambda. In this case, what I, uh, I forgot to mention earlier, the use case that I'm, I'm walking through on this is a root user login. And I, I specify user because sometimes users and accounts get kind of confusing depending upon which uh, cloud native platform you're working on. In AWS, an account is basically a container that holds all of your functions and users and stuff like that. The root user is created when you create a new AWS account. It has root access to everything in there. And best practices state that after you created your root user, you go through and you create an admin user or an admin role that people can assume in that environment, and that's how you actually manipulate the environment or the account. You should never log in with your root user unless you're doing stuff that requires root user access. So it should be very, very rare, few and far in between. And so what we're gonna be setting up here is a detection that says, if the root user logs in, let me know. Now, what I can do with that is I can go and I can check with the engineering team. Hey, did you guys log in with this? Is that on purpose? Where's the documentation? Do you have a ticket for it? Do you have authorization, et cetera? And if everybody comes back and says, no, I don't know what you're talking about, I can hit the big red button and we can do something about it. It's not, a, it's not something that I can necessarily put a lambda in to take care of because there's some questionable parts in there that require a little bit of uh, human interaction, but for the most part, it's a fairly simple thing and I can handle that. So the output of the event bridge can go to a Lambda or it can go to an SNS topic, it can go to an SQS queue, depending on how you wanna manage things. And I'm having it go to an SNS topic in this case. And then the SNS topic sends it to chatbot. Chatbot is listening for basically a, it's not sending because um, SNS is, is a message queue technology, but chatbot is listening to that topic. 
And if, and, and if a message comes up on that topic, then chatbot is gonna send it to my Slack. Right now, AWS chatbot has two outputs. It has Amazon Chime and it has Slack. They say in their documentation that they're gonna introduce other avenues, but who knows? Uh, for this example, I'm using Slack because that's what we're using. So this is some example code I ran in Terraform. At my environment, we use a CI-CD pipeline. We use infrastructure as code, and this is all example code. You're not gonna see Jupyter 1 code in here. But um, this is an example of the rule in EventBridge that's looking for the root user login, and you'll notice that the, the condition is success, a successful login by the root user. I don't really care too much about failure, but I could put that in there if I just wanted to keep track of it for whatever reason. Again, because we're using the source on here says aws.signin, that is a default AWS service, and therefore we don't get charged for event bridge ru uh, rules constructed around that. So I'm not paying for guard duty to evaluate this, and I'm not paying for event bridge to evaluate this, but it's still getting evaluated. Now I do have to pay for the SNS topic because that, that part is not free, but the, uh, since this is a management event, I'm not paying for CloudTrail. Since this is a default service event, I'm not paying for EventBridge. Uh, I am paying for SNS topics and Chatbot is currently free. So three out of the four steps in this, I'm not paying anything for. And then we've got some more uh, Terraform configuration. Infrastructure as code is a really a great way to do something like this, especially if you're trying to find the, follow the DIE triad where things, once they're in production, are immutable because you can't change this stuff without going through the CIC pipeline. People have to peer review it, they have to approve it, et cetera, et cetera. And then you need to set up the SNS topic as well, and uh, then you need to enable chatbot. There's one gotcha about the chatbot. You can't do it through code entirely because you have to go log in with a user that has permission to enable that service for the account, and that user, the person that has that role or that, that user account, also has to have enough permissions in your Slack workspace to connect AWS to your Slack workspace. So you have to have somebody or two people standing by to, to coordinate efforts to get that done. But once it's turned on, then you can go back to Terraform and you can configure everything in code again. You don't have to worry about it too much. Now, you'll notice down here at the bottom, it says guardrail policies, and I chose the guardrail policy AWS deny all. The chatbot service is designed to be interactive. The AWS concept is that you can put a chatbot into your Slack and then you can interact with AWS and change things by giving commands to the chatbot. But the thing is that the chatbot uh, is scoped to the channel that it's in. So anybody in the Slack channel where, this, where the AWS Slack bot is sitting can issue any command that that chatbot is authorized to take and it will do it on their behalf and the logs will show just that the chatbot did it. So I don't know if Alice did it, I don't know if Bob did it, I don't know if Hacker X did it, somebody in that channel did it. And sure, maybe I have Slack logs and I can go back through and investigate and find out who did what, but that's just a really poor practice that I'm not gonna do. I just wanna be notified that something happens. I don't want to manage it from Slack. I have no problem logging into the console and doing what needs to be done and then making the changes in code, getting it approved, etc. So I put in the AWS deny all. Now, Anybody who has heard about the Capital One breach a couple of years ago knows that it was a misunderstanding about how the uh, S3 buckets are configured for, with respect to permissions that allowed that to happen in the first place. So when we talk about that, the AWS deny all isn't enough. You've got to lock that chatbot down, which means more, more, and more. There are at least four different ways that I discovered that you can kind of bypass some of the chatbot restrictions if you know what you're doing. So I have like four different sections restricting what chatbot can do. This is a read-only chatbot. It tells me something and that's it. Won't respond to any questions, won't do anything. And then once that happens, this is what it looks like. Once I've got that configured, once I've got it in place, this is, what, this is the message that I get in Slack that says a console login uh, sign-in was detected. This is the user, this is what happened, et cetera. And you can use that link to, to check it out uh, if you have a, a role or a user with permission to investigate that sort of thing. You could then ingest this, uh, you could also ingest this into a different SIM if you wanted to or some sort of Splunk-like thing for forensic analysis. I mean, you can do whatever you want to do on the other end of that, but this is basically the 
beginning and end of everything that, that I'm doing in this one. This is one rule that I know is important to my environment that I want to be able to monitor that costs me pennies compared to doing the same thing in guard duty or some other managed sim or Matano or anything like that. Now, I forgot to mention this at the, at the beginning, but if anybody has any questions as I'm going along, please raise your hand and let me know. Uh, there's time at the end for questions, but I'd rather take them organically as we go along. So I'll pause just for a second here. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Um, so the question was, just in case anybody couldn't hear it, does, is there a way to allow for persistence with respect to the event bridge rules? And yes, you can. The event bridge rule is not smart enough to say wait until this triggers 20 times, but you can have an event bridge rule that says look for this root user login and then put it on this SNS topic. And then you can have another event bridge rule that's looking for that SNS topic and what it's looking for is that SNS topic to fire 20 times in five minutes, something like that. So by chaining, chaining the event rules together, you can do that. And this really starts to get into building your own sim from the ground up, which may or may not be worth your time and investment. Yeah. You would be, you would be charged for the SNS topic from event bridge rule one to event bridge rule two. You would be charged for event bridge rule two evaluation and then for event bridge rule two's SNS topic out to your chatbot. So it's still cheaper than using guard duty, but not, you know, 75% cheaper like what I'm doing. Any other questions at this time? Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is just an example of one rule, but like I said, I was using threat modeling to identify where the weakest points in my infrastructure were, the things that were most critical to detect. And then I could build rules based off of that and only worry about those, which eliminates a whole lot of noise out of my environment and fulfills all the, you know, we, all of our critical and high vulnerability issues that uh, we determined from our threat modeling. We can provide assurance to our customers that yes, we are indeed taking care of those. And then later on, when we have the staffing for it, we'll start, you know, handling a lot more of the things that are a lot more fuzzy, like maybe they're gonna be important, maybe they won't. Any other questions at this time? Because if not, then we're going to get into a demo and I'm going to do it for you live. Yeah? All right. Uh, so you should be able to, to see this. Hopefully that's readable in the back. I tested it out earlier. It should be good. But here's the code. Just like the code that I was showing you in that screenshot, this is it. Now, this is all part of my um, open source public GitHub repository, so you're not going to see anything in here that is uh, specific to Jupyter One or anything like that. But this is all in my GitHub repository. There's a link at the end of the uh, of this, so you can get access to it and get this presentation too. But what you can see is I have th this right here, CloudTrail. This is uh, infrastructure setup. We've got to set up some infrastructure. It's not necessarily part of the demo itself, but you got to have CloudTrail, or else you have no data to feed into the event bridge. Uh, S3 is where you store your CloudTrail data. KMS is so that you can encrypt your CloudTrail data because honestly, nobody should be looking at your logs unless it's your security people. It shouldn't be accessible to just anybody. And then there's the event bridge rule, just like what I was showing in the, in the screen capture. Here's the definition of the SNS topic and the attachment of the, poli the policy. And here's the chat bot with all of the restrictions that I created for it saying, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. All you can do is send a text or a message to Slack. And then here, what I have is I have just a bunch of code. And uh, this, the, my demo script there just allows me to reset this thing and do it over and over again without screwing myself up. It's set right now to run. And because this is Terraform, then all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell it Terraform apply. I have a bunch of Terraform files in here that I was just showing you, and Terraform is gonna go through and it's gonna figure out all the different AB, a, AWS API calls that it needs to make in order to create all of the resources and configure them in the way that I have specified in my code. And it's gonna do that analysis, and then it's gonna come back and ask me, are you sure you wanna do this? 
So it's telling me that it's going to add 19 resources. It's not going to change any and it's not going to destroy any. I can also go back through here, scroll through this and see exactly what changes it's going to make. And uh, all the way at the top, you see those green pluses. It has a legend all the way at the top to tell you exactly what the symbols mean because they're not always green pluses. But you can see green pluses create and then we've got read for data resources, stuff like that. So you can actually examine every single one of these resources that it's going to create before you give it the go ahead and tell it yes. You can do a plan ahead of time instead of an apply and that will give you this without asking you to create it. And this is what it's doing. It's going through right now. It's making API calls to AWS as we're looking at it, creating things. Um, this CloudTrail bucket lifecycle thing takes 32 to 42 seconds to do. I'm not sure why this one takes so long. It's a, an interesting thing because it's just a feature of S3 buckets and it takes the longest out of all of the S3 bucket creation steps. It's interesting. We'll hit 30 seconds elapsed and then it will end shortly after that. It might hit 40. Oh, there we are. 32 seconds. And here we are. 19 resources added, zero changed, zero destroyed. Okay. So what I need to do then is I need to bring up my browser that has the stuff in it. Oh, it's in this one. Forgot. No. Why did you log me out? I don't want to. Yes, here we are. I created a, uh, a Slack workspace just for this demo. It has one channel in it, the B-Sides demo channel. There's nothing in there right now. And here we have the AWS Management Console. So I'm gonna sign in. First, I'm gonna sign in as a user, an IAM user that has, a, um, that has uh, permissions to, doesn't matter what I put in here, uh, that has permissions to log in and see things. This is an admin user, but not a root user. And of course we need multi-factor. Okay, so I'm logged in. Now, the thing that we're looking for here is no message in the Slack channel. But while we're, while we're doing it, it takes about 15 seconds or so once the event occurs before it gets through the whole system and comes out. It's not the best amount, but I mean, for the price that I'm paying, 15 seconds is all right. But I can go in here now and I can take a look at all of these different aspects and I can see, oh look, I do have a topic. I have an SNS topic called root console logins. And if I look at S3, I can see the bucket that was created there, the B-Sides Las Vegas 2023 demo cloud trail bucket. I can look at event bridge and I can see the rule that I created down here, root console login and the details of that rule, just as I, just as I configured it in Terraform. I'll sign out. We have no messages in this channel, but now I will sign in as the root user. And there, I'm signing in as a root user. I don't need to do anything. I don't need to interact with anything. I'm just gonna sign out right away. And like I said, it takes about 15 seconds. But we'll sit over here and uh, we can, let's see. Two, three, four, five, six, there it is. And there it is. We know the user agent that was used to log in. We know that it was successful. We know that the, the exact account and identity that was logged in, we've got a, a, a link to the CloudTrail event itself that, could use to, that we could use for more further investigation. We've got an event ID. Now, if we've got a couple other AWS services turned on, such as uh, CloudTrail Insights, we can you know, form some queries, we can do some more investigation, but that's beyond the scope of this particular talk and this demo. Uh, I just wanted to be able to show you whether you use Terraform, whether you use CloudFormation, whether you go in there and you hand jam it yourself, although I wouldn't recommend that people make too many mistakes. What, however you do it, 
you don't have to go out and buy the big sim right away. If you're doing proper threat modeling and you know what your biggest risks are, you can mitigate those risks with a couple of simple rules at 75% off the, the list price, essentially. And then you can have your security team handling it, doing it, whatever it is that they need to do. And um, let's see. Nope, nope. Ah, here we are. These are all the resources that I used to come up with this, the documentation on the pricing for all those different services. Um, I did some quick rough math using Google searches on average SIM costs, as well as some analysis I did at Jupyter One itself because you know we're trying to get the most bang for our buck. And all of this is available on my uh, GitHub repository that you can get from that QR code right there, including the presentation and the templates that I made that I showed you about the Terraform code. Your mileage may vary depending on how well you can read Terraform. So, any questions? I, I left in like 15 minutes worth of questions. I, we've got 13 left. Um, any, anybody want to talk about something? Yeah. Um. I really appreciate your, uh, your talk today. Can you tell us about any major limitations that uh, this particular model that we should be aware of, anything that we're gonna have difficulties with? Probably the biggest limitation that you're going to find with this sort of model is managing the list of rules if you kind of go hog wild with it. Uh, this is really meant for, for like, if you've done a very good, I keep coming back to this, but if you've done a very good threat analysis of your environment, and you, you understand the threats very well. You can target certain things that you need to know about right away, and you, you don't have a huge budget. Once you start getting above, I'd say maybe a dozen or two dozen rules, you should probably invest in something a little bit more full featured, and maybe tune that down to where you need it to be instead of tuning this, this up, because the management and the administrative overhead is gonna get you. Anything else? Yep. I like your vest, by the way. Uh, I kind of got two questions. So first you're saying like if your, uh, if the number of events or the number of things that you're looking for would increase pat and kind of get wild, how easy do you think it would be to be able to tear out the like cloud trail and event bridge section and plug in a larger CM if your company grew to a size where you started to care about that kind of thing? I don't think it would be that hard because I'm actually looking at that right now. So I've done some I've done some research on that. Like, how could I tear out this minimalist micro sim and install an actual official, like a big boy sim or something like that? Um, it doesn't look like it's going to be that hard because a lot of the sim vendors, if you're talking about cloud native uh, services or uh, vendors, they want to get fed those events directly. And they will, what they'll do is they'll read it from your S3 bucket. So getting those events to them is going to be a fairly simple thing. You're just going to have to deal with whatever their pricing model happens to be. And then you're also going to have to look through all of their detections to find out which one fits the use case that you have, because obviously your name for your rule is not going to be their name for their detection. And the de detection name for vendor A is not going to be the detection name for vendor B. So you're going to have to spend a little bit of administrative overhead to do that mapping of what you're currently monitoring that you can't lose to what they have in place. And then you're going to have to start filtering out all the noise of the stuff that isn't relevant to you because you designed your architecture using the DIE triad, you're using cloud native resources, and you don't need to worry about all of the legacy problems that a lot of other companies are trying to track down. And then one more if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, which would be so uh, on the Lambda side of things of being able to kind of enact remediation steps if you already have them, how often would you see people plug in even more complex code like uh, Python or C++ code that would do like advanced remediation techniques well, versus just continuing hand jamming problems over time? I'm not, uh, I'm not, I don't know how familiar you are with, with lambdas in general, so uh, please, please take this as I'm not trying to be insulting or anything, but lambdas can be written in Python and C++. You can write your lambda in pretty much any language that you want to, so it can be as complex or as simple as you want it to be. Uh, you could write APIs that just interface with uh, AWS services, or you could have code that goes out to the larger internet and does things, like it does a Shodan search and ingests the results and then does something with that and goes out and talks to VirusTotal and comes back and does something else with that. 
it can be as simple or as complex as you want it to be. That's one of the things that's great about using this sort of thing is that you don't have to worry about buying a SOAR in addition to a SIM. For anybody who's not familiar with a SOAR, it's basically an automation platform that people generally plug in with a SIM to do this sort of thing. But you can do it all in Lambda if you want to. And the great thing about the Lambda is that if, since it's all contained within the AWS ecosystem, you can use your same CI CD pipeline to verify it, to do the code scanning on it, to do the peer reviews on it, to make sure that everything is as immutable in production as possible, as opposed to relying on scans from some third party vendor and making sure that everybody is syncing properly across multiple different vendors trying to do the same sort of thing. But uh, you can make it as complex or as simple as you want, and where the limit is for what is too co too complex for you is determined by your own organization, how many resources you have, how much, how many um, Fs you have to give about it. Anybody else? Yeah. Have I ever used this in a multi-account scenario? And, and, and so how would you, would you deploy the same Terraform into each mm -hmm. individual account and have yeah. them all report back to the same Slack room, separate Slack rooms, or would you aggregate well, them at the SNS level or? My production environment is a multi AWS account environment. So I, I can actually speak to this. And I will tell you that there is a gotcha associated with this in that the AWS sign-in service only operates in US-East-1 only operates there. So anytime you sign into AWS, it's going through US East One. They have hot failover to another region in case that whole region goes down. Uh, so you shouldn't have to worry about it too much. But what that means is that you have to set up um, every event bridge installation or instantiation has a default event bus. And that's where CloudTrail pushes its events to the default event bus. But when you need to cross regions, what you have to do is you have to set up a non-default bus. You have to customize your own bus and you have to give it permissions. You have to give CloudTrail and S3 and whoever else permissions to push events to that non-default bus. And then your rule in the same region as that bus can fire on it. So it depends on whether or not you want it to be completely distributed or if you want to have some form of consolidation. There are a couple of gotchas in there with that with respect to the services and the way the AWS implements them. But it's actually not too difficult. Once you understand that this service is limited to this one region and then you have to configure the, the regions to talk to each other, once you've done that, then it's easy. And basically the code that I deploy to all of my accounts, no matter what region that they're in or, or anything like that, is basically the same. I just tell them all, go to this same event bus in US East 1 because I configured that event bus to be pushed to from any region, from any service basically with restrictions, I'm not crazy. Um, and, that, and that way the, the event bridge rules that I set up in that region will always fire on the, the whole of all the data that I need to be monitoring. One thing that I didn't mention earlier is that this sort of thing is great for compliance. Um, just in case you're, you're a GRC type minded person, if you wanna be able to prove unequivocally to an auditor that you are actually monitoring for root user logins, a lot of people will, will try and just generate a root user login event that their SIM will catch and then they can show the event and stuff like that. But here, not only can you generate the event, but you can actually show them the code and say, listen, this is exactly how it works from beginning to end. There's no black box magic with the SIM. This is exactly it. And anything that your auditor says, well, I'm not so sure that this evidence supports proving this sort of thing. You can do the exact same thing and you can put it in within an hour. Any more questions? Any further questions? We've got another five minutes. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Great Thank job. you. Thank you again.